Hello everyone, welcome to the Richest Men in Town podcast. I'm Mike Freeman and along with my good friend and co-host Tyler Gould, we're excited to welcome you to our little podcast project. Tyler and I are just a couple of middle-aged husbands and dads driven to live our best lives. We want to be better every day, so here we'll be sitting down with great people. Not famous people, but great people that we admire. To learn their secret to living the rich life. Probably not the rich life you're thinking of. Our guests come in humbled and surprised at the invitation and hopefully leave feeling proud and grateful, realizing just how good they really have it. So pull up a chair, stay a while, and raise a glass with us as we toast our guests to the richest men in town. All right, Mike Freeman, we just spent some time with your friend, uh, Stephen Mitchell, and it was it was fun and it was a ride. So tell me about some things that you like, uh, that you appreciate about Stephen. Uh, you know, I told you, uh, Stephen Mitchell is going to be an experience uh, unlike any of the other episodes that we've had. And, uh, and he lived up to, he lived up to all of that. Uh, Steve's, Stephen's uh, journey uh, th- through fatherhood and being a husband, but man, he wears his faith on his sleeve. And he's so uh, sincere about the path that he has been on. Uh, you want to talk about change. He has made change that sticks, right? He has become a different person. And, and that different person has stood up through the test of time, right? It's interesting because last week we had our, early, our, our youngest guest. And this week, Stephen Mitchell is our is our oldest guest and he's coming in with an energy, right? He's coming in with a vibrance that fired us up. And I think anybody that spends some time listening to him is going to feel that same fire. Yeah, I I think so too. I mean, he, he did a great job. I was just touched by his, uh, when he was talking about his mom and his dad and, and sort of their example to him and, and, you know, you mentioned, how do you honor your mom and dad? Well, you've already asked, he's already answered that question by just talking about the things that he remembers. So I, I was really touched. I, I, I uh, first time I spent any, any amount of time with Steven other than a, a brief pre-show phone call. And I came away feeling uh, like, I'm, I'm just grateful that we got to spend some, that I got to spend some time with him. He's, and he uh, changes, he changes the way I look at the world. Yeah. I like how Steven sees the world. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and his views kind of uh, helped me understand uh, a little bit more about what this life is about. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope that, you know, for, for those that are, are going to listen and tune into the podcast and, and hear the episode with Stephen, that maybe they take a minute and see some things through Stephen's eyes and, and, and make some changes in their own lives. I mean, this, that's what this is all about at the end of the day. We get good people come on. They sacrifice some time so that we can all learn something, become better. So let's take action. Let's do something. Please, if, you, if you're enjoying the show, take a moment. Give us a review on Apple Podcasts. Check us out wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we'll, we hope you enjoy your time with Stephen Mitchell. <laughs> let's get this thing started, Tyler Gould. How are you, sir? How are you? Fantastic, man. It's been a great day today, actually. I'm uh, – I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking to Stephen Mitchell tonight, yeah. man. So yeah, I, I can feel the energy, man. This guy's going to this guy's gonna come. Uh, I know he's excited to talk to us as well. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation leading into this uh, with him, uh, kind of pre-planning. And, yeah, it was fun. Uh, Steve, Stephen's going to be a wild ride, and I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I mean, we had, we had fun with him the other night, so... So talk to me, man. What's been happening uh, in the life of uh, Mike Freeman and the Freeman family? Well, you know how much I would love to say this episode is brought to you by the Chicken Shack because the (laughs) Freeman family just had Chicken Shack. And I think every time I talk to you, the Freeman family is eating Chicken Shack. Not the Chicken Shack like you know, but here in Redding, California, we got a good thing going called the Chicken Shack. Yeah, you described a few of the the meals, and I was kind of I was kind of jealous that we don't have anything like that down here. Yeah, chicken and waffles. Who knew, man? That combination. I do love chicken and waffles, man. I'll be honest. I love chicken and waffles. What's happening with you? What's uh, what what are you thinking? Uh, you know what? I, I I'm feeling I'm feeling good, man. I'm, I'm feeling like uh, I you know. The, the winds of change. I check this out, man. Yesterday I went golfing, 
with a, a friend of mine, um, Otalea Tuiko Lavatu. And uh, he spent uh, six weeks in the hospital, man. Three of those in a coma with uh, coronavirus. Yeah. So it was sort of a momentous occasion to be back out on the golf course with him, um, healthy, freaking strong, driving the ball like 300 yards. Okay, so is that like near-death experience? Yeah, he was the, – the whole – 18 holes, man. He was filling me in on his, his experience and it was scary. He was gnarly to, to say the least, man. I, I, uh, it was pretty awesome though. He, he's just an awesome guy. And I mean, wow. What a, does it, what a, does, does he talk about how it changed him at all? I mean, it's, that's hard. He, he didn't really talk about that. You know, one thing he did say, say was that, he felt like he was really close to the, you know, I don't know, the, the edge of crossing over to the other life, you know? And, and he said it would have been very easy at that moment to just let go and step across, take that one step over. And he said it was, it was tempting and easy, but he talked about sort of the pull of his family and, and wanting to, to, you know, stay close to them and, and, uh, fighting for that. You know, I guess when he, when he came out of things, he told the doctor, you know, send me home and let me, let me, uh, that's how I'm going to survive. Let, let me go home with my family. And, and the doctor, I think eventually the, within a day, let him go home. Um, and he's been thriving. You know, he had some memory issues, I think, to start it when he first got out of it. And, but he, he looks like a million bucks, man. And he's, uh, he, you could tell he's very, uh, has a, a hunger for life, you know? So, but he's, he's kind of always been that, that way. But I, I can see there's a little something, a little something more to it with him right now. It was just great, man. I was telling him, I said, man, being out here on the golf course with you, it's like, uh, this is like prayers answered, you know? This is a lot, a lot of, a lot of time uh, as a community, I think, down here. This guy's, he's a beloved guy. And, and uh, I know my family spent a lot of time on our knees together praying for him. Well, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that the, the, the miracle of prayers being answered. Um, our good friend Rajiv, uh, he dropped a couple of episodes uh, ago. And uh, the day that our episode with him aired, his mother had a heart attack on the beach over in Eureka, California. And uh, he texted us scrambling, um, you know, and, and the prayers immediately commenced. Yeah. Uh, his entire, his entire family and circle of friends uh, and, and his, his faith group all reached out in prayers. I think, uh, I think mom was um, just happened to be on a beach where there was a paramedic. Yeah, it's like crazy. on vacation and the paramedic came and helped with CPR. Um, and then I, you know, I, I think that the whole next day she struggled uh, w- with heart weakness and had to be, had to be shocked, you know, 15, yeah. 20 times. Um, but she's making it, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's the last, uh, last text message that, that I was involved in on a, on a chain with you and Rajiv. It's, you know, things were looking really positive. I mean, and that's a that's a crazy thing. It's like uh, I I hope that because we're all going to have situations, maybe not that intense, but intense enough for us, right? We're all going to be in the in a situation, and I just hope that like when when that moment comes along, I'm in a place where I I'm quick to 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 call on you know, a higher power and have faith in that higher power rather than just sort of be needing that experience to, to shock my faith into action. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that that's where that childlike faith comes in, right? Yeah. You know, like the, you know, the story, you lose your keys and the kids, you know, we're scrambling, retracing our steps. We spend two hours and the kids like, did you think about praying about where your keys are? And you're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, and then, and then I think the other side of that is to be able to, you know, uh, when, when those, when those miracles happen, you know, I, you know, there's, there's the, the story of the guy who's walking on the edge of the cliff, right. And he, he slips and, and he's, he's falling off the edge and he's kind of plummeting to his, to his demise. And as he's falling down, he's praying, you know, uh, you know, God help me. I'll do anything. Save me, save me. And he, as he's falling, he, he reaches out and, and grabs this branch that's grown out of the side of the, of the face of the cliff and he's dangling and he's praying to God, you know, say, I'll do anything you want if you just save me as his grip is weakening on this branch. And he, he is, he, finally his, his grip gives, he falls and he falls about a foot and lands on his feet on the ground. And he says, yeah, never mind, God, I got it. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the, the, the challenge is to, to maintain that faith, right? Cause the, the tendency is that, that in times of darkness or trouble, we're really, you know, we're, we're more vulnerable, we're more, more humble and we're, we're reaching a little bit more and, and uh but when we're fat and happy it's tough to maintain that uh that level of humility and 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 faith well and rajiv shared that term with me that i had not heard before that heavenly butler i love that yeah you know and like how quickly are we to throw throw our requests out there in prayer and then just and then just move on right yeah yeah can the yeah. Gould family do you think the Gould family i mean i think that if i pointed to you and say hey can you can you show me a miracle i I hate to be like al michaels do you believe in miracles right (laughs) but like do you think that your family can point to things or experiences where there's 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 been some deliverance or there's been a a miraculous recovery or yeah you know that's that's an interesting question because i you know i I don't know that I, I haven't had uh, this, these experiences where I've, where I felt like uh, the booming voice or the, uh, you know, a pillar of light, if you will. But, but I've seen a lot of things in my, in my life that have, that have worked out uh, in spite of my own doings. And I recognize that as a miracle. And I think for me, something that really, uh, you know, bolsters my own faith is, is looking at the small miracles that, that I've re- received. And you know, what's interesting is that I, I it, for me, it's kind of an exercise. I do that. Like I, I kind of take notes and write those, those things down because I want to reflect on them and remember them. Um, but I've had moments where my kids have said things to me about things being miracles that honestly, I hadn't even thought about. I just thought about, you know, like probably that guy on the side of the cliff. I'm like, man, we were lucky, right? Yeah. <laughs> the reality is there, there's some intervention and it's been good to see my own children. I mean, and my wife's fantastic at that, right? She is quick to identify those things. But yeah, I mean, look, I don't know that I have a regime moment or, a, you know, but I, but I have a lot of little moments that uh, over the course of 45 years sure have put me in a place where I, I rely on my faith yeah i think uh i think i'm the same i mean i i wish you know you make it this long and there's there's dumb things that i did as a kid that just worked out yeah <laughs> that had no business working out totally. um but you know the the miraculous thing for me is uh that i that i married who i married right and the miraculous thing to me is that um Take your time whenever you're ready. Is he in? Steven's right here. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I've been he's here. He's looking at us. He's right he's here. Looking. I don't. Well, you got to put it on. Uh, we're gonna put it oh, on my goodness. Speaker view. <laughs> Steven, <laughs> Steven Mitchell. Oh, how are crazy. you, brother? Oh, gee. <laughs> no, I didn't know what was going on. I'm listening to Tyler. I'm. I'm just listening. I'm. I'm. I'm good. Well, welcome to the richest men in town, Stephen. Yeah. That's really nice of you. I'm just, oh my gosh, the amount of, I just freak out. <laughs> oh my heaven. Well, let me, let me, let me tell you this about Stephen Mitchell, Tyler. Yeah. I, 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 I 
don't think I can say this about all of my friends, but I can actually remember the very first time I met Steven. And uh, I, I love this guy and I'm so excited to have him on my podcast, our podcast, uh, because every time I'm with him, he does something to the way I think. And he does definitely does something to the way that I believe in God. And Stephen, I, I cannot wait to get into this. But since you've been a fly on our wall listening, we've been talking a little bit about our good friend Rajiv uh -huh. and that situation with his mom. Right. And just the miracle of that. Wow. And talking a little bit about miracles in our life. I don't know if you've got a, that's, that is the disadvantage of joining us, right? Jumping in. But I don't know if you've got a miracle story in you. Well, I got a miracle. I yeah? Have, uh, yeah, I have several. Um, the Pick most, one. well, I will do that. And I say several, not, um, not in a flippant way, but, uh, the Lord has landed. We were at Brandy Creek a number of years ago and Taylor, Taylor was only in, and Julie, my wife, well, she'll correct me. Um, I think he was about four or five and we were at Brandy Creek and we were with our friends, Louie and Linda. And we were having a little picnic there, and I had an aerobi, those just those discs without the oh, yeah. inside, and we're flipping it around with Louie, and I'm supposed to be watching Taylor in the water. And so the aerobi flips out into the water, and instead of just paying attention to uh, Taylor, which I was assigned to do because Julie was on the shore with Linda, anyway, what happened is I turned to go ahead and get the aerobi. Taylor goes under the water and I turn around, I don't see him. And then this huge Samoan man comes out of the water. Taylor's head is back and he's not getting air. And the man looked at me with blue eyes and just said, you need to take care of your son. And he handed me Taylor, Julie, like Mama Bear, came running, grabbed him, went to the beach, started resuscitating him. He coughed up water. Oh, my goodness. And he coughed up water. He was, he was drowning. He wow. coughed up water. He finally coughed up water. And so I, I am just running around, and she's asking me, you know, what happened? Why did this happen? I just felt like the lowest man of blows. And to make a long story short, once the lifeguard came over and looked at Taylor and his, he was blue and his skin returned the color, I turned around and it wasn't more than a minute where I started combing the beach and this guy was wide. I said he had blue eyes, maybe he had brown, but he, he was like a brick house Nobody on the beach knew who I described. Nobody. Wow. Nobody. So, so, so let me ask you this. Yeah. How long before you forgot that and just went about your business? Never. That changed you? Never. No, never. No. How, how, how does that... How does that go on the back burner? Oh, yeah, you know. Well, you know, sometimes our human nature is that, you know, thank you very much for saving me in that emergency. And then 15 minutes later, we, we, we we're on to something else. You know, I, mean, I, appreciate, I really I appreciate that, Mike. But in Taylor's case, he will say to this day that uh, God allowed him to live and he's got purpose. That's and awesome. it, it changed the whole family. And it really changed us because when that man looked in my eyes, take care of your son, that was the height. No, he was about three. That was the height of Taylor just being, he was, he, he was stubborn. He was, uh, he had a, one single piece of um, coleslaw on his kitchen high chair. I was with him. I got so upset. He was there for four and a half hours. He would not <laughs> eat that. No, this is serious. Four and a half hours. He would not eat it. And I even tried, oh, his dad, very patient father. I just jammed it between his teeth. <laughs> Tim, read it. Tim, read it. <laughs> One piece. He wouldn't eat it. And then at about 11 o'clock at night, as my wife 
lovingly says who stayed up with him. He just basically, he was nodding off. And Julie sweetly must have just told him, son, eat that piece of coleslaw. And he grabbed it like no biggie, ate it. <laughs> you talk about your question about tiny hinges. <laughs> unbelievable. I got, I, got a, I got a Grace Freeman story like that, too. We're, okay. uh, we're traveling to Utah. Utah's a 12-hour drive. Right. We stop in Susanville for breakfast. Okay. We're in a hurry because it's a 12-hour drive. So okay. Grace is a tiny thing. Uh, she might be maybe two, three years old. Okay. And uh, stop at the McDonald's in Susanville, hotcakes and sausage. And I am telling her to finish that last bite of hot cake. We got to go. And she doesn't want to. And I said, eat it. And she's just looking at me. I take the fork. I shove it in her mouth. I put it in her car seat. Right? We proceed to drive four hours. <laughs> I get out to fuel up the car, open up the back seat. She's there with her mouth full of hot cake. <laughs> For that long? Yeah. Oh my heavens! I want to swallow that last bite? Oh my gosh! All right, let, so let, her and I had a little look at each other, like, "I got you. I see you." Kid. <laughs> let me circle back for a second to hey, Tyler. To the to, and it's great to have you, Stephen. I'm excited about tonight. I let's let me circle back to that to that miracle because you know Mike said, "Well, how you know." how long before you put it on the back burner? And, yeah. and the answer is, is never. And, and, you know, Mike, you made the comment, well, Hey, sometimes 15 minutes goes by and, and you forget, but sometimes, you know, there's, there's a lifetime of, of things that are going on and we dull our senses, you know, a little bit to those miracles uh -huh. and we just start to, to forget them for what they were. Right. Absolutely. And so let me ask you this, Stephen, what's, what is it that allows you to hang on to that and keep that at the forefront? Because I believe like you, I think if we have those experiences and we, we reflect on them often, we make them part of who we are. It, it, it allows us to, it propels us in a, in a positive direction. Right. Okay. So what, mm -hmm. what's, what's been the, the, the trick to keeping that, that experience handy and, and useful for you? Uh, good question, Tyler. I would, I, I definitely would say the contrast, I mean, it was as though this guy was so wide, so dark skin that there's no way, no how that nobody on that beach, I don't know if there were 20 people on the beach that never saw him. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know him coming out of the water. Even nobody saw him. But that's what everybody said. So it's like somebody's in the water and they're nine foot nine. And then you ask later on after your son has been saved and he was blue and he's finally coughing up water. Did you see a nine foot six guy? Did you see him? No. I mean, what are you talking about? No, that's why, that's why honestly, it's never left. And for Julie and I, with all that Taylor was going through, and it was only a small season, after the coleslaw, I mean, he became a different kid. We became yeah. different parents. So I guess it's a lot of things. Yeah. I love that, though. You know, you have those experiences, and then we, you know, I, I, I like the idea of we, we hang on to those things. We, we sort of apply the principles. I mean, how powerful is it that someone – hands you your son and says, take care of your son. I mean, oh, that's like a, that's tough, right? That is, oh, that is tough. The way he looked through me, Tyler. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I just admire, Stephen, you jump into a conversation, I throw the word miracle out there, and you say, yeah, which one? Yeah. That is awesome. That is awesome. Right? Yeah, no, yeah, that is. Because, Tyler, we talk all the time with our guests, and on this show, that theme keeps coming up, remember. Remember, yeah. remember what God has done for you. Remember that we're, we're all, we're all <laughs> saved by grace, right? We're just wretches that, and, uh, and I, and I, I really admire how quickly you were at the ready to, I don't know if I could do that, honestly. Oh, yeah. Oh no. Thank you, Mike. But you know, that story though, that, that event, that life event, 
I mean, I've told unbelievers that. And yeah. I, the excuses I hear of what I might have actually happened. And yeah. it's, it is absolutely the same thing as people seeing the Lord raise Lazarus from the dead. And then people turn their backs and say, believingly, I never saw a thing. Right. I never saw right. it. Yeah. Wow. And and uh, even anyway. if they did, right? There's those that did see it and still walked away and 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 were empowered for a moment because of what they saw and then right. and then let it let it fade. And I think it's there's there's uh there's a lot of power in in remembering those experiences and and using them for for what they're meant for, I think, you know, which is to push us in a direction where it, one of the things you said, Stephen, was after, you know, after that experience and after the, the coleslaw incident, right? Yeah. Taylor became a different child and we became different parents. And isn't that what we want to say? It's yeah, oh throughout our lives is that I've become different. Oh, right? Yeah. That experience changed. Hey, so, so Stephen, we have you for, uh, we have you for a little window of time. So uh, I want to jump right in. I want to jump right in for our listeners to uh, get as much out of you as, as we can. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. All right. So for the sake of time, Stephen Mitchell, uh, let's say you're in an elevator, right? And I got two minutes. Who is Stephen Mitchell? Um, uh, this is, if I was in an elevator, here is the song that would immediately come to mind. It's the uh, second stanza and the chorus of Secret O Life by James Taylor. James the Taylor. secret of life is in opening up your heart. It's okay to feel afraid, but don't let it stand in your way no longer. Because anyone knows that love is the only road. And since we're only here for a while, you might as well show some style. Give us a smile. Isn't it a lovely ride? Sliding down, well, be gliding down. Try not to try too hard. It's just a lovely ride. And if I had more time, <laughs> I'd go Love it. In, in an elevator. I would go ahead, if the elevator got jammed, and I would have this poem that I wrote uh, on the cloud, and it's titled, Time Showed Slowed Sweet. Out of five boys and a sister to Stan and Jerry Mitchell, a geeky, kind kid could have sworn I was being chased by girls as the fifth beetle in a hard day as night. <laughs> I even had a set of racing stripes on my 1963 Rambler in high school that had no reverse or second gear. You've got a friend. Lori, my girlfriend, man, she had upper body strength to help push my car out of a parallel parking mess i was the life of the party at chico state until drinking took the life out of the relationships cars and me clinging to god writing poetry and posting it on my dorm door connecting and learning from others about their lives and mine evolving europe for six months in 76 Michelangelo, Vincent Van Gogh, and two girlfriends, one in Switzerland and the other Berkeley. Paint flying adventure in color splashed, some beyond recognition, and others, photographs of David, the Pieta, crystal clear, and a self-portrait of a bearded, waft, pipe-smoking man out a window, right-hand drive, Mini Cooper, Edinburgh, Scotland, click, jump to 1987. And I married my dearest friend, Julie, and to Weaverville, God's creation, working with artists, and then through the greatest artist, Jesus, I was born again on the road to Trinity Center. 
two lovely children blessed, Olivia and Taylor. Oh, how life flew by together. Just the two of them in our VW bus and me, summer vacation to Gold Bluffs Beach. Time slowed sweet as the bus forever crawled up Buckhorn Summit. 60 horsepower. Olivia, much more horsepower than that. And at the age of 20, hey, Poppy, I just can't play Candyland one more time. And, ah, uh, grown Taylor at 16, still holding on to nostalgia and memories. Cracker Jacks clinging, smashed to our bums. Hey, you guys want to play another game? And in conclusion, on that elevator, here now, Lord Jesus and my loving family, grace abounds, missing my mom and dad. And after 30 years of teaching, still bubbling and laughing with joy, my former students now in their 20s, they spot and bolt to stand in front of me in a target. And a bit shocked, I jump with a Medicare hop. <laughs> Remember me, Mr. M? Remember my first name? My last? Uh, come on, Mr. M. Smiling, they wait for what seems like hours. And on a stage of old, I remember every once in a while, their name will boldly proclaim what their eyes spoke so clearly before. Uh, Levi. Yep, he beams. And as natural and free as an eagle soaring, he quips, you know, Mr. M, you look a lot better than I thought you would. <laughs> and yep, it just doesn't get much better than that. There you go. Love it. Either Gould, that's Stephen Mitchell, man. I love, I love it, Stephen. I've, I've got a lot of things I wrote down there. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> I and thanks you, hey, for the I, invite I, for the assignment. I, <laughs> assignment. I, I'm, I'm telling you, you've never been on a ride like this before. Oh man, I, right? I, I love it. I love it. You guys, thank you for listening. Thank Stephen, you. thank you. Hey, thank you for thank you for uh, so beautifully, poetically, and concisely telling me a little bit about who you are. Telling us a lot. Yeah. Right. And actually. That's kind of how. That's kind of how I picture dying. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea—it's almost flashes, right? Mm -hmm. Scenes, no. moments, inside jokes and references that clearly Tyler and I don't understand. Cracker Jacks on your bums, or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But it's a—it's like a slideshow. And it's it's all those things that are on your heart, and your heart's huge, brother. I appreciate that. Bless you, Mike. Yeah. I, so, Stephen, i i want to I want to look at some of my notes here that I've that I wrote <laughs> down. But before before I before I Absolutely. reference those notes, I would love it if you would kind of give us a little bit about you growing up and and what that was like, and and. Um, I mean, we got we got some of that in in the poem, right? Yeah. Okay. But if you can give us a little bit of of background on on your childhood and 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 mom and your dad parents influence on you, yeah, that would be awesome. Sure. Uh, yeah, five boys: uh, Gary, Jeff, Mike, and Randy, and myself. Uh, brother Mike lives in town, and uh, my sister Julie. And uh, it was a, a Catholic family. Uh, we lived in the Bay Area, San Carlos, California. Um, it was a wonderful childhood. I mean, I, uh, my mom, uh, my mom, uh, she was about one of the most loving, selfless gals around. I mean, you can imagine five boys. I mean, when somebody fell off a cliff, somebody else had their hair on fire. I mean, it's like, what? It, I mean, I don't even have any idea how she did that, really. And then my sister came, which was, oh, my sister Julie. When she came, there were balloons that my father put up on the antenna, 
And uh, mom was so excited because she finally said, I got somebody with indoor equipment. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I For a very it. reserved mom, man, that was really quite hilarious. Yeah. And anyway, so I never forgot that one. And uh, so anyway, my mom was just a loving gal. I'll tell you more about her later. But it was a very busy house. My father was a, um, you know, you think about... Um, the guy in, um, you think about the guy in Back to the Future, Doc, right? Well, my dad, he had well kept up hair, but he was, he was an inventor. He could fix absolutely anything. I mean, I have this one memory where we were all around his truck. I think there were at least three boys at the time. And there's a squeaking sound. So he asked us to come over because he would fix everything. I mean, I don't know anything he couldn't fix. So we were all, he says, come over here, sons, come on, come in. And so we all put our head over the truck and he said, you hear that sound? Okay, where do you think it's coming from? And so we had our deals. Well, dad, looks like the fan bell. Absolutely right. Shut that thing down. Let's get going. And so wrench by <laughs> wrench, moment by moment, there we were with dad. And so we were all inclined to, I mean, I had the feeling, although my father never said it, that if you had to take your car from to a mechanic, you were actually less a man. Less a man than you could have been. But that was my take. But that was my take. And it was so much fun. I mean, I, okay, anyway, I could get into all the brothers. No, I stuff. agree. I agree with that take. I agree. I feel so vulnerable. I feel like it's just like, I take my money right now because I'm going to walk in. And I'm going to tell you I don't know what's wrong. And you do. <laughs> Hey, Stephen, let me ask for the parts, Mike. They say, I don't know. <laughs> we had them. Let, let me ask you this question. Uh, you, you. So anyway, my father was in the tile business. He was okay. an electrician when I was born in um, uh, Oregon. And then uh, my grandfather, so my mom's dad and brother that worked the tile business, Peninsula Art Tile Business, they gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. But with that offer... He left electronics, which was his deep love. He had spent time in the military. He had to go to the military uh, at 17. Uh, he didn't tell the truth about his age because his mother and father needed money. My father was a really hardworking man. And I just have to say that it was a little bit tough sometimes because when you go home and you're working with your wife's dad and son, well, things, get, things can get funny. Oh, for sure. But dad I, made the best of it, and he yeah, was man, awesome. I, he was a contractor. He wasn't a setter. Yeah. How long? Uh, how long have your parents been gone? Mom died in November of last year, and I was there when she died, which was really. Uh, she had dementia, and yeah, it was it was tough. Uh, uh, sounds like a like a powerful powerful woman and a strong influence. And one of the things that I thought about, Stephen, as you were describing your mom, you, you sang John Taylor, right? James Taylor. James, James Taylor. Taylor. Sorry, same James Taylor. Yeah, tell me, tell me about that love for music. Where does that come from? Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. It, it always happened. It was always uh, right out the chute. Oh, Mike can tell you. I'm constantly giving Mike things. I told Mike. Some are appreciated. Blow. Some are appreciated. Some aren't. And I'm trying. I'm trying, Stephen. <laughs> I know you try. You try hard. I, Tyler, I just loved music. I mean, uh, it was definitely, I mean, Ed Sullivan right now on our stage. I liked it. I mean, I was like 10 inches from the television in 1964 when they're there with all those arrows pointing down on them. I didn't know what to do with myself. You know, girls passed out. I don't know what I did. I did something. I had my face in a pie or something. I don't know. But anyway, I've always loved music, different kinds of music. I love jazz. I love rock. I don't listen to enough classic like I do. I'm now starting to get into country and Western music. And I just finished a book on Johnny Cash that I absolutely loved. Love and uh, so, yeah, all kinds of music. Not enough classical, though. I need to get more in classical. My brother Gary's very much into that. So, what Tyler, that? if I can just interject really yeah. quick here. he When he says he loves music, he's... He's not kidding. Like, and actually, don't don't knock it. Right. One day uh, we're having a conversation, and he's discussing Johnny Cash, and I flippantly throw out there how much I don't appreciate Johnny Cash and how I feel like he's overrated because he just talked 
and doesn't sing. <laughs> and it was like, Blasphemy. honestly, Stephen, I, I think I hurt your heart that day. Right? <laughs> well, and then you tell me, and then you start telling me about his, his walk with faith and, you know, his, his journey. Oh. And, and honestly, I got in my car and I put it on Spotify for a week. Johnny Cash, my kids would get in the car and they're like, what is this? And I'm like, you know, I'm just trying to give this guy a chance. Let's give it a chance. And we gave it a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was... Well, see, Mike, that's more than other people would give the <laughs> God gun it. That uh, would give him sometimes. He's yeah. got his fingerprints on all kinds of music. Uh, oh, my gosh, music. Tyler. What a story. Yeah, yeah. I, you appreciate I, I, Mr. Cash yourself? I, I'm a huge Johnny Cash fan. I'm, I, lo I love music, too. So when you're talking about music, I, 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 could, I could talk with you all day long about yeah. music. I, I love it. It does things for me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an escape. Uh, it's a, it, it's a bring me to reality, uh, pill. And it's also, uh, something that, that invokes the spirit in me that, that, uh, wants me to, to do better. So oh, yeah. I listen to music all the time. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh, and, and Christian music. I mean, I have a, I, I followed and still have read what two books on Rich Mullins. Rich Mullins, our God is an awesome God, he reigns. Oh, my heavens. Yeah, he was a dulcimer, a hammer dulcimer player. Oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. what's, the, what's the significance of the, of the James Taylor song? Is it, what's the, why does that have a, a well, special meaning for you? Uh, James Taylor has been, ever since he was, uh, even his first album when he was with James Taylor and the Flying Machine, you know, in Fire and Rain, where he says the uh, pieces on the ground, right? Pieces on the ground, that's the flying machine. When the flying machine broke up, a holy host of others, well, guess what? That's because he was introduced to Peter Asher, and he ended up as the first, James Taylor ended up as the first recording artist there at Apple Records with the Beatles. So a holy host of others is the Beatles. Wow. And they sang back up George and Paul. Oh, now I'm getting into it. Oh, gee. George and Paul. George and Paul sang back up for him on something in the way she moves. Oh, I love that. So, yeah, absolutely. So, not Harrison's version. This right. is James Taylor that I believe Harrison heard. And uh, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, I love so, it. So what did you think, what, Stephen, when the invitation came out to be on a, on a show called Richest Men in Town, what, what thoughts ran through your mind? Well, first of all, Mike, um, because it was coming from you, uh, that, that was the difference. That, that was the big difference. You know, that's, well, that's what it is. It's, uh, I can tell you, we're, we're, just, we're grateful that you're here. I mean, uh, I'm excited about what we're gonna, where we're gonna go tonight, and kind of how the the journey that we're gonna go on together, and and what we're gonna learn together. I mean, and and I can tell you right now, um, I'm already feeling like there's there's gonna be some stuff. Yeah. So, Stephen, copious notes. One right? of the things that one of the things that kind of drives us crazy, okay, is we're looking for we're looking for folks that are cut from the same cloth. Okay. Right. We're looking. We're trying to be better. And we have people in our lives that are trying to, to be better. We have people in our lives that we're, it's, it's not accidental, the people in our lives. And we have, peop we have some people that are teachers um, that teach us the things that we need to do to be better. In your humble opinion, why aren't more people trying to be better? I think it's too much trouble. It's too much trouble. In a confusing world, here's a, here's a quote I just heard from D.L. Moody. I have had more trouble with myself than with any other man I have ever met. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that, Stephen, because before, the, before you came on today, I was, <laughs> Come on! Right, I was telling Mike, I'm like, we were talking about change. And I said, you know, a lot of times people they talk about change and they want to change the what's on the outside, right? I'm going to change my job. I'm going to change my friends. I'm going to change my house. I'm going to change my location, but uh, wherever you go, there you are. Right. And uh, you, 
if we don't work on ourselves. And that D.L. Moody quote made me think of that, right? I mean, if we don't change ourselves, then what good is it, you know? Well, that's, that, 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 that's like the text you sent me today, Tyler, that, right. that Marcel Proust, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Oh, my. Right? Tyler, right. What, what were you thinking as you sent that to me? I, just exactly what, what Stephen's talking about with that Moody quote. You know, I think that, that sometimes when, you know, we, you and I have talked in the past, Mike, about whether big changes or small changes. And I'm a believer in making small changes, lots of them, right? We're constantly adjusting. And, and if we're constantly adjusting in the small ways, then we're going to get where we need to be. I think that sometimes, you know, that idea of, of it being too much trouble to change because people look and they say, gosh, for me to be where I want to be, I'm going to have to change so many things about myself, right? Or I'm going to have to change so much in my world. And I think that if we just, if, if we look at the small things and we take small steps, we're going to be where we need to be. And that's sort of what I thought about when I read that quote is that it's not, it's less about the landscapes and more about what we do with our, with ourselves, discovering ourselves. You know, those Stephen, Stephen made yeah, reference absolutely. to some of the work, some of the work that uh, I've done with him and, and Rajiv and Carol and Andy, great, great people, great work that we were, we were uh, able to pour into the to lives of some kids that, that were struggling. They were struggling. Right. And uh, Stephen would share this message, Tyler, that was so dang powerful uh, playing off of, I think, Switchfoot, yeah, right? And the lyrics of More Than Fine. Like, I want in this life, I want more than fine. Mm. And there's a lot of people that are okay with fine. Oh. You know, and, and, and Stephen, I loved your answer, right? It's too much trouble, too much hassle. Fine well, comfortable. And I also think it's too much trouble, Mike, because it's about pride. I mean, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity said the greatest sin is pride. Another quote that many people have stated is, is if you're full of yourself, there's no room for God. Well, hello. So no wonder I won't change because my way is the highway and I got my name on it. So you know what? If you want to use it, talk to me. I kirumba. <laughs> what do you don't want to change? You're and not I, listening. I, you I, two I, ears, I, one mouth, and your mouth just gets big and wider and wider and wider. Well, and today, in yeah. today's world, it and gets, then your ears, they just fall off. They and just today's, fall off. today's world, everyone gets louder. Absolutely. Right? If they're not listening, get louder, Mike. Right. But I think it's like when you didn't like Johnny Cash and I tackled you. You didn't tell <laughs> Tyler that. <laughs> hey i but i support that i you know but <laughs> he's got to learn somehow hey you know Stephen, you've said this you said it's it's about for pride, fun right it's about pride and and i i i believe that as well i, I was having a conversation with someone a, a while ago and we were talking about change and they said i am who i am and people are just gonna have to accept that and i just thought man that is that's a sad road to go down because it, it doesn't allow us to take advantage of the opportunity to overcome things. There, there's, there's a lot of power in finding victory over the things that hold us back. Amen. Right? Absolutely. And if we can, if we can embrace those challenges and we can, we can push forward. And you, you said this, Stephen, in, in your, your poem, you said you, you were going through your, your, it was the timeline, right? And you said you were the life of the party at Chico State, yeah? And then drinking kind of became, became something. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we looked at that moment and we said, hey, you know, what, what does it look like if you don't embrace the opportunity to change? What does that look like? Well, yeah, but can, can, we, can we do an autopsy on that moment of change, Stephen? Like, sure, I'm sure. assuming, I'm assuming that, your pride crumbled. Yeah. So, so what it was is um, um, we, were, we were married in 87. That's actually just an amazing story. And I ought to tell you that later. But 
We were married in 87. Wait, 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 wait. I'll remember where we were. To, you got an amazing story about getting married. Tell it. Yeah, well, this, no, this, this really is a classic, and this tells you about who my mom and dad are as well. All right, I'm just going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a post-it in that story of changing. You tell okay, me. You no tell problem, me. because this one leads to Let's go. the alcoholism. Okay, Mike. Let's go. So, and I'll try and be as detailed as possible. So, Tyler, you also watch the guardrails for me. Keep me in line, would you? All right, All right we'll do. All right, so here's the deal. So I'm, I'm in love with this gal, head over heels. And so I'm in love. She's a teacher and where I'm working at the time. And so it's getting serious. And it's looking whoa, whoa, whoa. like. You're, you're, you're fishing off company pier? <laughs> that's a rule steven mike, mike that sounds really sleazy back on <laughs> i never heard that darn thing okay so <laughs> i don't even remember what story i'm telling okay so so we're really involved and no i didn't meet her on the company pier Okay. Well, we are involved. And so I tell my parents, and this had happened before I had another proposal. Uh, anyway, I won't tell you that one. I won't bring that up. That's a so, terrible story. Yeah. Keep yeah. It's a bad story. I don't want to talk about it. So my parents tell me, listen, this is what we're going to do. You're close to this gal. We're going to take you to a weekend, a three-day retreat through the Catholic Church, and it's a marriage retreat. And so what they do, which is incredible design, they have a priest to talk about biblically what marriage is all about. Then they have two couples that are there also that have been married at least 20 years. And so those couples, it is their job to go ahead and talk about their relationship with God, money, and sex. And those are the big topics besides the priest interacting and talking about the biblical view of marriage, money, and sex. And so what you get is you get the, the priest going first with the biblical account, whether it's sex, money, or, uh, you know, God's creation of marriage. And then the two people just talk back and forth about how sex started, how it changed the low valley, dark places, the mountaintops. Well, come on. I'm like, at the time I was 30, I'm hearing for the first time, this is marriage. I never saw any of this. I have no idea. And I came out of a family. I don't know anything about this. So I'm listening, right? So here is the brilliant piece of it. Okay, we got God's word undergirding all this. And then we got people transparently talking that are so honest and transparent that I've never heard anything like this. And I'm looking at love. And then they hand us a paper that has a bunch of questions on sex, on money, or on God and theology and marriage. And we go to our separate place out on these grassy knolls. It was on this monastery. We answer all of our questions according to what we think without the other person in mind. Ooh. Then you <laughs> switch papers. Oh. <laughs> Holy mac! <laughs> oh my gosh. So here you go. We switch papers and you are reading your life story. And you're just, okay, so what I think is first, right, first priority. This is what I get. Eventually, I get from these three papers. Her priority was family, job, God. Mine was God, family, job. Uh -oh. I looked at that. I said, I, I knew immediately. We had a long conversation, and we couldn't get married, and we ended the relationship. So, I go... <laughs> I go home. My mom has cooked something. I don't know. It's pasta gravy. It's something special. And I'm coming home because they're waiting for me. And I told them I'd come home to their house after I was finished. So I come home to the house. Dad, dad's at the table. Mom's there. And the minute I come in, she goes, oh, my gosh, son, 
son, tell me, tell me all. I'm just dying to hear what happened. My father, who is a very dry sense of humor, what a hilarious man, one of the finest senses of humor I ever thought. He said, okay, son. All right, sit down. What happened? Dad, okay, what happened is, <laughs> is that this whole thing was involved. And after we went through these papers and I told him the whole situation of how, and my mom is going, Oh yes, yes, yes. My father says, okay, so what, what, uh, come on, son, now uh, give it up. What, what happened? Dad, I decided not to marry her. What the, are you kidding me? I paid $125. <laughs> I said, and no. So I know that dad is baiting me. My mother, for the first time in her life, I think she hit my father on the shoulder. <laughs> she couldn't believe he said that. And then playing into it, I said, dad, $125. I could have been unhappy for the rest of my life. <laughs> and he says, it's still $125. <laughs> That is great. At school, I'm in Durham Elementary School, so I'm teaching with Mr. Scudder. I'm teaching um, earth science. We have our garden. Everything's all cool. Well, there's a gal in my class named Leslie Lim. And her mom, Nancy, so Julie's aunt, she hears that something didn't happen right with the gal. So she says, Steve, uh, are you still dating her? And I said, uh, no, 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 we completely, and this was only about two weeks after we broke up. Needless to say, un, unannounced, her whole family is there. It's the graduation party, eighth grade graduation party for their daughter, Leslie, who was in my class. We meet, the whole family's there. I have to ask permission to take Julie in the car to show her photographs and etchings. That's how I met you. Julie, that's the short version. But anyway, so, wow. yeah. Well, it was an amazing, amazing thing. And the thing was, too, is that when I walked into their house in Durham, they were actually playing videotape because I was the one of the key speakers at the graduation. So it was like, okay, yeah, here's Elvis. He just <laughs> Anyway, I didn't feel like Elvis, and I just fell head over heels with Julie, and we dated two years and then got married. That's great. And she's the catalyst for the change. Because 1987, we're married. In 1988, Mike, um, she, she told me that, uh, and I was drinking to the point maybe once every two weeks, once every week, but she saw the cycle. I said four beers, it was nine beers. I said three beers, it was 10 beers. Absurd. She said to me, listen, this can't continue if we are gonna have children. And she said it in such a loving way looking at me that I don't rightly remember if it was before she said it or after that I heard directly in prayer from the Lord, not audible, in my heart, Steve, to have a personal relationship with me, you need to stop. I went to one AA meeting, and 33 years later, I, or 32 years later, I just celebrated 32 years of sobriety. Wow, congratulations. And it was actually pulled from me so immediate that I really know, in the same way I know about that Samoan man being an angel, I know the Lord took it. Yes, it's been hard every once in a while. I can't share a glass of wine with my wife. But as I've told Mike before and I told kids, always when you're experiencing, and I'm really paying attention to anybody that is Folks that are suffering in addiction with alcohol or drugs, it's so hard. It's so hard. It's so hard. But what happens is, is you, you get to a point where I hear, in this case, from my wife, and I heard from the Lord, that 
these consequences. So what I got going is a huge rear view mirror of rubble, rubble, broken relationships, broken promises, brokenness, broken that, everything shattered in the rear view mirror and it's giant. And my windshield is about one eighth the size of going forward. I'm constantly looking back and finally, I say, enough rearview mirror. And because of Julie and the Lord, once I made that decision and he helped me, all of a sudden I got a shrinking of a rearview mirror, shrinking, shrinking, and I have a widening windshield forward. That is what happened. I love that. Stephen, thank you for letting us in on what that what that looks like, what that what that felt like, still feels like. Right? Yeah. Congratulations on thirty two years oh, of sobriety. Yeah. So um, and and I and I I just wanna I just wanna echo what you were saying. There are so many of us, I'll I'll include myself, right? We all are working on things and that that path to recovery from addiction man that's a climb i would just say too though that that faith plays such a huge piece in that you know i love when you talked about the lord taking it from you because you gave it to him mm -hmm. yeah well there there's the choice mike you give it that's to him absolutely he right. takes it and you know those those messages mike they can come from so many different places you know tyler where the greatest message was that actually started turning me it was from, uh, I was reading a book, an Alcoholics Anonymous book. And like I said, I only went to one meeting. Yeah. And um, Doc Severinsen was in there and Grace Slick of the Jefferson R airplane, right? And then the Starship, Jefferson Starship after. She said this as an alcoholic. If you think you have a problem, you probably do. Yeah. And she went on to talk about it. Yeah. People that drink that don't think about drinking. They don't have a problem. I mean, that really turned me. That yeah. was like a key in the door. Yeah. Well, do I think I have a problem? Yes, I do. And then the question is, what's the question next? Right. What am I going to do about it? Right. What am I going to do about it? And you can go ahead and psh, one more time, but the echoes of what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? They're still there even if you try and silence them, even if it's a little squeaking sound in the corner of the room, what are you going to do about it? You got to do something about it, whether it's that, whether it's any change you need to make for any, for yourself, for someone else, for your family, for a friend, mending something that went wrong. What are you going to do you, about it? What are you going to do about it? Yeah. I love that, that, well, there a couple things, right? I mean, it's no wonder you identify with Johnny Cash's, uh, right, a little bit there on his, his story of change, right? I think that, that uh, yeah, and I, and the other thing is, you, you know, you, there's this, there's the theme, right, of, of change. You talk about, uh, early on, you talked about the experience at the lake, and the guy coming out of the water and handed you his son, and you said, my son was a different boy, we were different parents, right? You have this experience with, with your wife who has the, the courage and the, and the, 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 the wisdom to, to say what she said to you. And you, you take that and let that become change, right? Absolutely. And I think that we, we have these moments. And I think this, is, this goes back to what we talked about earlier, right? We, I believe everyone has these moments, now, the question is, what are we doing with the moments, right? Are we, are we holding on to them? Are we letting them drive us forward? The question that, that you ask, what are we going to do about it? I mean, that, I, I love that idea of, of taking those moments for what they are, right? Because you have a choice at that moment of how you're going to react to your wife saying something to you. But it's, the great thing about it is mm -hmm. nothing is a choice, right? Doing nothing about it. For sure, choice. you're making right, right, right. choice. No, for sure, and I think that you have right. You have that choice. You're it's staring you in the face. It's I'm gonna I'm gonna 
ignore this or I'm going to do something that, that's going to impact the people that I love in a positive direction. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's, that changes you entirely. Uh-huh. I, I, I love that. And, and now, now Stephen, here's, here's the connection for me, right? Because you've ha- you have these experiences. You've done this work with Mike. Tell me about reaching out to other people and helping other people embrace change. When does that become a passion for you? Oh, you're some. That's a great question, Tyler. Um, I think, um, you know, if you look at what the uncle said to Spider-Man, I mean, it's not, when you, when you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit through your belief in Christ, and I mean, here is uh, <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 8, 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You are saved by grace. That is God's unconditional love for you. He created you for relationship, and you are saved by your belief in that. And it's because it's not of yourself, because it's a gift, you can't boast about it. You can't, like I used to think, (laughs) how many women do I have to help cross the street? I don't see any old ladies. I mean, I had all sorts of things in my head. I mean, I, I, well, I, I, I can echo that. I used to think it's like Pac-Man, right? We're right. going around doing these things and gobbling up points. Hey, I did that thing. Put it in the ledger. Hey, I did that, 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 that other thing. Oh, you know what? And I went to that meeting, you know, and I said that nice thing and I opened the door for the lady and it's like, you don't get it. You don't get it. His grace is sufficient. Oh my gosh. You Mike, know? no, absolutely. No, it, it's just so, um, anyway, so if you start getting puffed up at all, I just look at that and say, what, what are you doing? And I do, man, I get prideful. I roll my eyes at my wife. She asked me to do something. I groan, I grumble. It's like, what are you going to do, Steve? Just go outside and beat yourself with reeds. Or beat yourself with oak bark. I mean, something. But no, I... In light of that, in light of all of that, Tyler, to your question, you have to, in the same way, here you you go. One of my things about helping people came from my mother. We'd be, I don't know how old I was, but it happened several times, and it was really uncomfortable because I was a teenager. So we'd go out after uh, church, and we'd go to breakfast every once in a while. And you can imagine what that was like with, uh, I don't know how many brothers at the time. Maybe it was four boys. Maybe it was all six of us. But anyway, it was mostly just boys. So we'd go to IHOP or we'd go out somewhere else. And my mom would see somebody, regardless of anything about him, she looked at the work. What I'm saying is she didn't, It was someone that is stellar, someone that is just working. They are doing an excellent job. And she'd look over and she'd say, she'd fold up a $5 bill. Steve, Steve, go give that to that boy and tell him he is doing an excellent, excellent job. And what he does matters. Let him know that, son. Wow. And I would say to, oh, come on, mom, you can do it yourself. Steve, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. And so I go over there. Well, that happened enough times that when Taylor, in particular, I think I did this with Olivia, but it was mostly Taylor. I don't know how many times we did it. He was like four or five. And I'd see somebody with a sign at the Rayleigh's on the grass or whatever. And I'd say, son, I got to go find out what this guy needs. 
son, do you want to go with me or do you want to just stay in the car? Well, I'll stay in the car, Poppy. Well, eventually he came with me. Well, that changed me. See, that changed me. I couldn't, I couldn't just not do anything because I had the greatest model I had ever seen for reaching out, loving, lifting up. Oh, she lifted up so many people, my mom. Oh my gosh. No, it was just incredible. I get all goofy thinking about it, but she was amazing. And so why was it easy for me or why was it easy for ZMAD, for kids that just needed a hand up for gosh sakes? They needed somebody to listen to them, listen to them, and then just go right down there as best you can. And then you find the riches. Start digging. Start digging. And then when you pull it out, you say to them or anyone, <laughs> this looks like a piece of coal now, doesn't it? But look at the underside of that. That looks like a diamond. You have a gift. And you tell them specifically what the gift is because you believe it. They believe it. Well, guess what? Stuff changes. Things change, man. People need to be lifted up. Oh my gosh, the grocery store, the people, the pressure with all the sanitation. Oh my gosh, this guy, I brought in a, my own bag in Rayleigh's, my plastic bag, and the guy, he's got a mask on, he's behind plexiglass. I bring him my bag, I set it down, he says, no, 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 get it off the table, get it off the table. I pulled it up, I said, geez, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry, I'm, I, I'm sorry. And then I, I turned to the guy and I just said, wow, you've got a really hard job. This is really a goofy time. Oh, man, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm sorry, I won't bring a bag in again now. It was like I gave that guy a bucket of really cold water and he went swimming. Yeah. Oh my heavens. You know, it's, it's fun. It's, it's interesting, that right? That was the it's, short answer. Well, I, I love that, Stephen. And I think that you know, I, I think that we all have that inside of us, right? It's wow. there. And we, we have to be reminded that we have that inside of us. Mm -hmm. And I think when we have those experiences, right? If we looked at, uh, I, think it's, I think it's John 14, 26, right? right. And, and uh -huh. Savior's talking about uh -huh. the Holy Ghost. And what does he say? Uh -huh. He will teach you all things and he will bring all things to your remembrance, mm -hmm. right? I think we have those experiences and, and it gives us a glimpse of who we really are and what our potential really is. And when we, when we realize that, or we have that brief moment of clarity where we see that we can't help, but want to help, have, help someone else have that same moment of clarity, right? The same, that, that the, the same way you say, man, you've got a hard job. And that young man, it just melts away that, that that tough facade and he can say yeah you know what you're right yeah, things are things are hard right now and i think that those things when that small piece that you say to that kid gives him a moment to see people for who they are and to see him for, for who he is right can you imagine can you imagine tyler Better, absolutely can you imagine a world where we were more concerned with the needs of the person next to us you know, like that question that Stephen asked, I need to go find out what this guy needs. Oh yeah. my goodness. That kind of melts my heart a little bit. That, you and know? that story of his, of your mom, Stephen, I just feel like, Oh my gosh. Like we, Mike and I have talked many times on this show about the importance of models in our life yeah. and then, and then modeling ourselves, right. Of what we should do or could do. I mean, how awesome how lucky you are to have that model of your mother. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you shared that because I, I jotted down in my notes a question, you know, to, for Stephen, how, how do you honor your parents today? But well, you, you don't need to answer that. Yeah. You already have, right? Uh, when I hear stories uh, of your mom and I know your walk and your talk right now, I see that in you. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see the ministering. I see the reaching out. 
And, and, and honestly, that to me, that to me screams you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, because that's what I'm frustrated about or I struggle with, right? Mm -hmm. Because in my mind, granted, it's a simple mind. Uh -huh. And it's a simple faith with very few moving parts, right? Tyler's bound. He's, 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 he's chomping. He's not going to say anything. <laughs> he's not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but in my mind, where Christ has been, it's different. Oh boy. Right? He doesn't come and temporarily change things. No. It's literally a BC AD moment. Amen. And I can point to points in my life where through experiences with his gospel, with the Holy Ghost, I can say, you know what? I walked away from that different. And 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 I I know I know that's the case with you, right? And I and I think that to me, I wonder I wonder why I, I don't seek those opportunities more often. Well, right? yeah, Mike, that's a that's a good question. But I think we don't we get uh, we we just choose some days to just put on a pair of glasses, so I'm not bothered by these other things that are out there that are calling my name. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think we really do choose the glasses too often. I can't listen right now because of blah, 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 blah. You know, and, mm -hmm. and that's what we really have to try and do is we really have to try and look at the glasses. Okay, here, here is, here's, here's something for you. Here's a quote. This is really outrageous in what we're talking about. This is also D.L. Moody. You ready for this? Hit me. Out of 100 men, one will read the Bible, and the other ninety-nine will read the Christian. No, that that, that I love that. Holy! <laughs> God. That is great. That is great. Out of one hundred men or women, one will read the Bible, and the other ninety-nine will read the Christian. Oh, come on! And you know what? God has a the Lord has a great sense of humor too. Here, I'm going off Cyprus. A guy's got a sign. I want a hamburger. <laughs> so, so, okay, I've got time. I'm going to get him a burger. I'm going to get him a soda and a big fry. I got it? And so I come over there. Oh, I'm shining my Christian apple. And I'm going to give him this stuff, right? And I talk to him. So how you doing? You got, you got food now. Is there something else I can do for you? Ah, no, no, no. This is good. This is what I asked for. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, I eat it right now. Come on, enjoy it. <laughs> we rolled up the bag, and I just saw him kind of hold the bag, and then I turned the corner, and I saw him put the bag somewhere, right? So I'm walking back. So Julie was in Florida gas station because it's a corner. I, I could have died. I have trouble controlling my 14, size 14 shoes. Anyway, so I cross, and then a guy drives past in a truck. He waves at me and says, hey, I saw that you just saw that guy. I've got a burger for him. And so he pulls over in the same gas station. He hands me the stuff that he bought him, and I go back to the guy. I told Julie, Julie, wait, wait, wait. We've got a catering business here. I'm busy. I'm busy. So I go back. This is classic. I go back and I say to him, okay, hold on a second. Gee, what do you have behind your backpack? Uh, well, it's nothing. Well, it was a bunch of Burger King burgers. <laughs> and I said to him, no, this is this is true. So I am really listen. I'm thinking to myself the whole time. This is absolutely God at work. If I had never done this, I wouldn't have been able to laugh like the Lord is laughing. So I asked the guy, "Okay, hold on a second, man. Look behind that thing. You got burgers coming out of your ears. You got stuff." I said, "What do you really want to do?" And the guy said. I need to go to LA because there's a job I want to enter. Well, change your sign. <laughs> yeah. Holy, Holy cow. 
Okay, so anyway, I didn't have a marker. I should have actually really got him a marker and helped him with a sign. Oh, don't ask for burgers anymore. Give me back <laughs> what I gave you. Man, I, I love that, Stephen. That is, first of all, that's hilarious. <laughs> Second of all, and I love, here, here's, here's my quote. I, I'm, I've got a whole list of quotes I'm writing down from, from Stephen, but change your sign. I mean, time. think about that. I mean, how, oh what are we projecting, right? And wh what do we really want to get to? And how are we really going to get there? And, and, and how, how often do we have too much pride to ask someone for the oh. actual help that we need, right? You know, it makes me, think of a, makes me think of a church yes. meeting back when, we used to, back when we used to have church meetings, right? We used to get together and yeah. congregate. Sure. And uh, I remember, I remember – uh, a woman sharing that uh, one of the things that she was trying to be more intentional about was uh, being more specific in her prayers and listing out, I mean, actually specifying the things she was grateful for. And then when there were needs, actually saying what she needs, right? Because God knows, God knows before we ask, yeah. right? But letting him in on the details of our lives and and I, I, I walked away very impressed with that specific in our requests for the things that we need, mm -hmm. right? Because how often do we pray in generalities? Wow. Oh, thanks for our blessings. Not listing anything. Hey, yeah. we, I, I, thank, I thank you for, uh, you know, I recognize your hand in my life, not necessarily spelling it out. Right. Right. And I think that that's one thing I had an opportunity to talk to some, some young people last night. And we talked about that. We talked about the habit of prayer and what that would do for you in your life. And then we talked about specifically what things could we do? What could we include in our prayers to make prayer more powerful mm -hmm. in our lives? Now, Stephen, I know you're a praying man and I, I've had many opportunities to have sweet, uh, sweet moments in prayer with you. Is there anything in particular that you found to be a tremendous blessing in what you pray for? Yeah, Mike. Um, uh, every morning, and yes, we miss some mornings, I pray out loud. And the difference when I pray out loud, especially when my wife is there, but I also, when Julie's not here, or she's not awake because I get up at a quarter to five and I have a regime with, you know, an hour of Christian radio and I walk and hold on, hold on, back up, back up, back up, back up. Huh? You get up at four forty five. I get up at four forty five and I've been doing that for over twenty five years. Well, we probably need to have a whole episode just on that. <laughs> well, I, I think that's great because I've always thought that nothing good happens in the four o'clock hour in the morning. That's, that's, been my, that's been my theory. But <laughs> I don't know, Tyler. God's still working. I guess he is, right? He's still working. <laughs> All right, oh, you guys are a kick. So some Christian, Christian so, radio, a so, walk? Yes. And I go for a walk. Then I read the word. Sometimes I write, um, I catch up on some news. Can I ask you really quick on your study? Is it, is it sequential study or is it by theme? When you read, when you, when you study the scriptures, is it just a con Okay, well, I'll have to tell you if you're interested in my born again experience, but what I have, so the way that I started that, well, I, I'll tell you that story later, but what I try and do is there are books in the Bible that sometimes I just, I will, I will read Psalms. And then I'll go from Psalms to the New Testament where um, things uh, inter, 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 are interwoven. They're interwoven. Okay. And so I, I jump about the Bible, but usually I will read one book at least, and I'll go ahead and read it through and stop whenever I feel I need to stop. And then I'll just, you know, like a, like a cow does with cud, I just get that word and then I just keep repeating it and repeating it. And then I just sit on it and then I just listen. 
I listen, and if I'm too too quick to speak, or I, I start having the busyness of the day, or what I have to do, this, that, the other thing, I got to squelch that. I got to start again. But it's more of a um, reading the word to not only get straight, because my rudder gets all goofy if I don't have the word, but it's also letting God speak and listen more than what I'm reading because I want to hear it. Come on, bring it on. Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. Like, what? What? The servant, he's got a platter or something? I love oh, that. Quiet. I love that thought because I think that well, I'll, I'll just speak from personal experience, right? When, when I'm praying, I, you know, I have routines that I go through as well, but sometimes I let my schedule interrupt right. those routines. And I think that the, the most powerful moments there for me are when I, I speak, I have that conversation and then I just stop and just, just sit and just let the impressions come, let the thoughts come and let the, I, that, I just, I think that's a lost component for, for people sometimes when they're talking about uh, prayer in general, you know, Mike, you mentioned that prayer of uh, thanks for the blessings. Uh, I need this. I need that. Uh, right. amen, and then you're moving on. And, and Tyler, I'm still bad at it. I still, sometimes right. I, I don't get to it. I put it off and sure. I put it off. Oh, heavens. Yeah. I, I'm in the same boat. Terrible. Yeah. When did so so Stephen, you you've kind of hinted at it in your in your introductory uh, in your elevator in your elevator introduction. You hinted at uh, something happened in, in Trinity. Yes. And so, uh, I'm I'm curious. Uh, when did faith become? Okay, this you was talked about. You talked oh, about growing up Catholic, right? When and, did when was I will have to I will life? have to say. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Cut you off. What was that, Mike? I'm just wondering when the when when faith became something, when it, when faith became a source of power for you in your life. Okay. First of all, being raised in the Catholic Church, I was an altar boy. Um, the Catholic Church was a very good undergirding for me to understand our reverence and how powerful God was. And that was a very important thing. Now, I did get through the Catholic Church because of the Missalette. And so when you're reading and Respisorial Psalms that you're repeating, and when you're reading it, you'd have Isaiah, for example, then you might have a piece of the Psalm, then you'd have the Gospel. Well, these were puzzle pieces. I always looked at it as puzzle pieces. Well, well, first, when I started going to church, they were still speaking in Latin. So, I mean, what the? That's very positive. Oh, my gosh. If God talks like that, I'm shot. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was trouble. So, anyway, with the Missalette, I had puzzle pieces. So, these questions happened. So, when I went to, from the Catholic Church, and I went to Chico State, I went to the a Newman Center. And that was more evangelical. And I was actually starting to hear sermons and a discussion that was, wow, this Jesus, this Jesus was real. And he had apostles that may have had some similar problems like I got. And that thought came to me, right? Now, that was a big thought, actually. Because as far as I was concerned, anytime I heard about the 12 apostles, these guys were so holier than thou that there's no way, no how I'd ever be able to follow Jesus. They'd say like, oh, come on, Steve, are you serious? <laughs> no, that wasn't a very good accent. But anyway. <laughs> it, sounded, so, it sounded Yiddish. <laughs> <laughs> and I taught drama. That was bad. Okay, so I won't try and recreate it. But anyway, from that point, what happened is, is intertwined with my alcoholism and failing, 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 two DUIs, accidents, I mean, you name it. Me and my prayers, Lord, take this from me. No, I want it back. I mean, the tug of war. Yeah. So I got that going on. So 
This is now 1993. So I've been clean and sober now for uh, five years. Pretty good math there. Five years. And in 1993, I am a, um, with the Trinity County Office of Education in Weaverville. And I am the arts coordinator. So I coordinate art shows, docent programs. I'm working with all these people. So I'm in Weaverville. We're going to a Nazarene church. Actually, we were going actually to the uh, Bethel church where Pastor Bill actually started in the theater up there in Weaverville. But hmm. this is extra information. So what happens is, is that I have this conversation with this good friend, Paul, and I am seeking, I am seeking. Well, there's two brothers in the they're not brothers. They're brothers to me. Steve Dunlap and Pat Curran. These two guys take their Bibles and we go downstairs in our rental house. And I am with these guys and we pray. And then I start asking questions. So I would say, where does it speak about marriage in the Bible? I was there, Timothy. I was there, Timothy. And so I've got this hunger going and I'm listening. And I am dry. I am dry. It is the desert. I am thirsty. And so, Brother Pat Kern gives me a box of John MacArthur Jr. tapes, Chuck Swindoll. I mean, we're talking opposite ends of the spectrum. Fire and Brimstone from um, uh, uh, John MacArthur and Family Man Stories with Swindoll. I'm getting all of this. So I am listening to Romans. And then I am just filled with this Jesus. And my friend Paul tells me, hey, Steve, you know what you really need? You just need some music. And so he gives me a Franciscan monk named John Michael Talbot. Terry Talbot, his brother, they do an album called The Painter, The Empty Canvas. I mean, I start listening, and all of a sudden, and he's singing mostly psalms, things from the psalms that are in there, and God is moving. I'm asking questions. So I'm in the county car, and I'm asking all sorts of questions. I've got a boom box that's seat belted on my right, <laughs> and so I'm ready to just go ahead and listen to sermons and get on with it. And so it's snowing. And I, it's snowing in Trinity Center outside on Highway 3 North, outside of Weaverville. And I am directing a Christmas play about toys. And so it's snowing and I'm going slow in the county car. And so Trinity Lake is on my right. And I decide, okay, I'm going to listen to this tape. The greatest man that ever lived. And it was on John the Baptist. So. It's snowing, I'm going slow, and I, okay, I want to hear this tape. I'm almost there with the kids. I know what to do today when the kids, and so I take this tape, and I start to put it in, and then I hear, don't put in the tape, and I hear, it's not audible. I hear in my heart, don't. All of a sudden, man, it was like this light weight was over me and i said oh uh, uh, lord is that you is uh, i'm gonna put in the tape and i go to and then i hear it again but it's not stronger like headlock and the noogie it's i have something for you and so then i started shaking I put down the tape. I heard that I needed to pull over the car. And yes, this is not audible. I'm not going nuts. I'm going to teach a school and the snow's falling and it's absolutely beautiful. And I pull over the car and I turn it off. And I just wait and I'm kind of crying and I'm shivering. And I said, Lord, um, what, do you, what do you want? And I heard, I want a personal relationship with you. 
I started weeping profusely. I told him, yes, 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 come in, take over. I've had it. I've had it. I'm done. I'm done with alcoholism. I'm done with religion. I'm done with everything. I need you. And right then and there in the car, I accepted him. And so this is at the age, at this time, this is at the age of 36, for gosh sakes, right? I'm 36. So how I actually taught little kids as toys when I went to the school, <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. After that, you, you went and worked okay, with so kids. Okay, <laughs> so the ending of the story that's unbelievable is I went back after that day. I, I don't think I was, I think I was quite useless that day. So anyway, I went back, told Julie what happened, and you know, just miraculous, and, and, and I was changed. I was changed in an instant. I was absolutely changed. Well, here is God still showing up. I go into church, and one of my friends in the church, and Mary Hansen, this is Bob Hansen, I was in two plays with her up in Weaverville. I mean, I was a big fish in a pond. I'm doing these plays that the, Jim Augustine is actually writing parts for me in these plays, right? So I'd, I'd done plays with her. She was a music teacher that was working out of the County Office of Education with me. And so anyway, Bob says, he comes to me in the foyer. He said, Steve, you won't believe what happened. And I said, Bob, <laughs> I can believe anything that would have happened. He said, I was in prayer on Friday, same day that this happened. And all of a sudden, I heard from the Lord that I needed to give you this Bible. Here is a plan on how to read it. You read two chapters out of the Old Testament, two chapters out of the New Testament, which are often fulfilled prophecy in a psalm or a proverb. Here you go. I heard that you need to finish this in a year. I finished it in a year, and what happened was, is like I told you before, all those little puzzle pieces that I couldn't fit, I read the Bible, and I had all the straight edges, and I had the borders. And from that day forth, I'm walking, studying, following the Lord, and it's a picture of Jesus. I had the context. I had, you know, when, when, when they're all, when the Lord talks about eating his, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, and he's talking to these men about what you need to do to give yourself unto me, and they start fleeing. They start fleeing. People start leaving him like, what are you, crazy? What's going on? And then he says, the Lord says to all his disciples that are there, his disciples, he says, so, Peter, where are you going to go? And he said, I have nowhere to go. You're the son of the living God. Well, that's what happened to me. I mean, what the heck? I have nowhere else to go. What am I going to go do? I love that. I love that answer in John 6. Yeah. Will you also go away? To to whom shall we go? Yeah. Yeah. What are you, you going to? And then Peter dies, hanging upside down to give the Lord honor. Martyred. Wow. All of them. All of them. Except for Judas Iscariot and John, as you know. Right. Yeah. On the island of Patmos. Anyway, thanks for listening. But that was that was it. And it was... Sometimes, like you were saying, Tyler, with music, it was the music that did it. It was the music that absolutely flooded me to such a degree that all of a sudden it was dry and it wasn't dry any longer. And so whether it was the sermons, whether it was the music, it was a combination therein and where I had already seen what the Lord had done through my alcoholism because of my wife and his intervention, you know, that's just a, it, it's just a through line. And whether it's laughing because the guy's got too many burgers and he got to change his sign, 
It's when you open yourself up for these little moments, if you're paying attention. That well, I just love, happen. Stephen, I just love how we started talking about miracles. And here we are <clears throat> coming full circle. And I, 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 I love that account. And thank you for 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 letting us in on that because Thanks because we talk we talk about it as a journey Tyler right I mean we talk about this process of making choices and and in little ways choosing him right choosing to be obedient choosing to be true to who we know we are before we came to this wow. life wow. right and yeah. choosing to <laughs> choosing to not be okay with mediocre choosing to not be okay with with being well at least battling choosing to battle right. the self choosing to battle the pride choosing to battle the the addictions right or the habits or or even even your bowl of pottage right there's a lot of people that give up give up faith for rinky dink things you know, have no you, eternal significance. Yeah. You know, Stephen Curtis Chapman says in one of his songs, it's like playing Game Boy in the Grand Canyon. I mean, what the? <laughs> well, you know what I love, Stephen and Mike? I, you know, we talk <laughs> about miracles. You know, we, we look at this, this journey that you've described, Stephen, from being a little, a little boy, listening to his mom talk about her love of God, being around your dad who showed you love and affection, right? Absolutely. And then, and, and you have all of these experiences that, that kind of tenderize our souls and our hearts, right? And then we get to this moment where we're, where we're prepared and then the Lord intervenes. You have this greater experience even still, and it just propels us even further. I, I just think we have... You know, Mike, you started out today before Stephen got on the, on, the, on the show and you were asking me about miracles, right? And I said, I can point to one big miracle. I could tell you a lot of small things. And here we are talking to Stephen, who's just described a list of small miracles that led to this great moment, but right? But you know what? I, I'm on, I think I'm on record as saying that every person that makes the choice that Stephen made, that makes the choice that we've made, uh, is a miracle. Amen. Mark. Right? Every sure. person amen. that says, because honestly, right now in 2020, it is, you know, there was a time when, when men and women weren't so free, didn't have as many options, didn't have as many choices. It is actually choice that's killing us. Right? In a day when I can pick up on this little device in my hand, yeah. I can literally choose to learn anything. And, and man, how Heavenly Father must be pleased when I choose to go to the New Testament. Oh, my gosh. Right? I could do anything with this. And I'm choosing to draw closer to him and to get to know his son better and to try to be an example and yeah. serve, serve in a way that, that he would be pleased and honored with. Right. I, I kind of, I kind of think it's it's incumbent upon upon us and everybody who's had these kind of experiences to remind other people of the experiences that they've had. Right? Well, we because said, we've said before have that all the time. Yeah, we've said before in moments of crisis or in moments of great sin, we should go to the person in error and say, "Not what have you done, but what have you forgotten." Amen. Mike. Right? Like what? Yeah. What have you forgotten and how can I help you remind you so we can fix this thing? And see, you, you know what, with what you guys are saying, that is so true. I have found more and more and more. If I do not, see, if I do not, if all I did was watch any of the news media out there, and that's all I filled my mind with, and I did not have any counter. For example, on the, on the proverb that states this here, proverb, Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. 
that is in the context of pride. There is a way in your mind that you believe that seems right. But in the end, it will lead to spiritual death. We are screwed up. We are, our minds can do anything they want. Man, if I'm raised and I'm told that black is black, black is white and white is black, I am going to have to go ahead and through, go through some kind of education that's going to say, uh, excuse me, that's incorrect. This is what it is. I think it's brilliant. It's, Tyler, I'm smiling ear to ear right now. I think it's brilliant that Stephen is referring to Proverbs because Stephen, last week's guest, okay. on his way out to college, his dad says, read Proverbs. <laughs> It'll make you a better football player. <laughs> oh, wow. Here you go. That's fantastic. But if, right, we, don't we, have, if we don't have those contrasts, we yeah. don't look in that rear view mirror. And like I said, in regards to my alcoholism, it's small. But when I go to help somebody in, in this presentation that I do called Russ Never Sleeps, I mean, when I do that, the point is, is we have to look at in our own lives, if we do not have the true line, then any line is true. If we do not have the through line, then any line looks like a good idea. I love that. You know and how many times yeah. have we said that, right? It's who, what truth are you holding in your hand that you just, you, you think this is how it is. And, and that is going to determine who you are in the end, right? It's like that old adage, when you pick up one stick, one end of the stick, you pick up the other end. That's it's right. So, it's so true. That's right. right. What, what are you grabbing onto and what are you holding onto claiming it is the truth? And man, if it's bad programming and you don't make the change, you're done. Yeah. Right? It yeah. won't work out. It won't work out right in the end. No, and I, yeah. I well, honestly, it's interesting, Stephen, because now I, I loved hearing about your parents and I loved hearing about their influence, but now your kids are looking at you the way you look at your parents, right? So yeah. well, before you go there, yeah, can I say one thing? Absolutely. You're I've, the told hero you about, here. I've told you about my mom. So I'm talking about learning from contrast. And you guys know, or anybody that's listening, contrasts in parents, right? We're, we're very different. We're very different in many ways, male and female. When we're married in particular, man, it's, it's well, you can be dating and it's very different. You don't know what the heck you're doing. But anyway, my mom, so we'd go out to... It's too big a family, you know, too big a family. They were on rhythm. So a lot of people were on rhythm, a lot of kids. So anyway, we go out to eat and it was rare. But when there was a line on the outside of that restaurant, my father would immediately go, oh, no, we're not going there. I'm not waiting. <laughs> I am not waiting. And my mom said, that's a line for a reason. <laughs> Good Stanley, food. pull over the car. <laughs> we want to go. So, there. My mom is the internal optimist. I my father, <laughs> here's the, here it is, Tyler. You'll get a kick out of this. I think Mike knows this one. My father's theme song. He would just sing it over and over around the house. You ready for this? Yeah. You make a date for golf. You can bet your life it rains. You try <laughs> and give a party. And the guy next door complains. That was my father's mantra. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so <laughs> later on, I asked him, Dad, do you know any of the lyrics? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Nat King Cole sung the song. He had the lyrics. But the point was, as it was a contrast of my father as a pessimist, and he had his own reasons, man. I mean, he had his own reasons, having to work for the family. His, my, my Dad's dad was an alcoholic, so he had his reasons. He had to support the family, his brothers and sisters. Anyway, but it was in those contrasts that you have to go ahead and choose and say, 
Is it a combination of the two for me? How am I wired? What are my giftings? What do I need to look at? And obviously, my sense of humor, bring it on, Dad, because my mom couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't give a line all that great. My <laughs> father, I'll take the humor. Mom, I'll take your optimism. I'll take the $5. Dad, I'll take your mechanics. I'll take your hard work where he got so mad at my mother sometimes that he said, that's it. I'm going to the library. And he'd <laughs> grab a banana. So I constantly put together reading with potassium. He stormed <laughs> out of the house. And sure enough, when I asked him what he got, I'd go to his bedroom every once in a while to see what he was reading because of the way World War II affected him. He was always reading about brothers that he lost in the war. My father was an avid reader. But the point was, is he showed me a way to handle anger, man. He grabbed a banana and he went to the public library, for gosh sakes. Well, because of those contrasts, praise God that I was raised with loving parents, even though they were an optimist and a pessimist, that you got to make choices. And sometimes I can't, I don't even have the right to talk about verbal abuse, child abuse. I can't even fathom. I'm just so blessed, as quirky as we all were, and as my brothers and sisters are still quirking it out, <laughs> at least we had a foundation that pointed us to the Lord Jesus, and it's in that, as we struggled through, and as we asked the question, Lord, if you're there, let me know. That's a, that's an open door. That's an open door. That's an open door. That's what people have to ask. You got to ask. You ask, you receive. All right. I'm talking too much. No, that was great. I, I love that, that thought, that train of thought, Stephen, because I think that, you know, you, you talk to people sometimes that, that don't come from the, um, that don't have the same examples maybe that you did right parentally. And, uh, and I, I still think there's, there's powerful lessons to be learned, right? We look at where we came from. Some of those examples we, we want to, you know, I, there's some things that, that my parents did that I want to do. Like mm-hmm. that is how I want to be. And there's some things that I, I want to delete, but I learned a lesson from that too is Right. And so we can look at both sides of that and say, okay, I'm grateful for the experiences, whether they were pleasant or unpleasant, and, and I, I'm going to be a better person for it. Amen. I've learned things that I want to be, and I've learned things that I don't want to be, right? Yeah. And so I think that, you know, if, if, if we had your parents on this podcast and we asked them the same question, they would probably have a similar response in reflecting on their their childhood as well. That's right? good. Uh, absolutely right. So, Stephen Mitchell, what are your kids teaching you about being a good man? Oh gosh, Mike. Um, I think um, you know. As I get older, I'm I'm 67, and you really you really see sometimes as much life as it may sound like I have. I mean, <laughs> my wife could tell you some calloused calcium deposits that are, you know, so I really don't know what I'm talking about. Bring Julio. <laughs> so I will only say that. That might be, that might be our soundbite from this episode. Yeah, we don't I really, really know what I'm talking about. about. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Mike, print it. Yeah. Absolutely. Mike, print it. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. So. To tell you what they're learning, I learn. Let me let me first answer the question. I am learning from them. My daughter, my daughter Olivia, teaches at Palisadro. This is coming into her sixth year of teaching out there. The amazing thing is that's where my wife Julie has substituted for over thirteen years, and before that, her dad's mom taught there in the forties. My daughter is the third generation at North Cow Creek. That's mind-blowing. 
She is such a good teacher. What I learned from Olivia, as you heard, she actually put up with us playing Candyland till she was 20. <laughs> she is such a grace. She is so smart. She is so loving. Her husband, Ryan, just love. What do I learn? I learned that, you know, I'm just so blessed to just watch her ask questions. And with Taylor, Taylor uh, graduated from San Jose State. He wants to be a photographer and use graphic design. Presently, he's selling high-end Audis, although that's been a tough old deal these days. But he is a heck of a, a talented man that where I'm really big and loud, Taylor is observant. He's sharp. He's so sensitive. He's so sensitive. So between his sensitivities, my daughter's sensitivities, they're both strong. And when I just listen to them and keep asking questions, and here's, here's the kicker. The best advice, one of your questions was, the best advice you ever received. Mm -hmm. At 25, when I was dating, I asked my friend Jim Matroni, give me some advice with girls. And he said, be interested, not interesting. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you know what? Tyler, this is a kick. So I heard that, and I thought, that is like, <laughs> you talk about a mind blower. It's so simple, right? So I take this girl out a short time after. This is uh, just before Julie by a few years. Take this girl out. I say, I'm going to try this thing. <laughs> I just asked her questions. Everything was a question. I am serious. I had to make up questions I couldn't believe I made up. I am engaged. I'm looking her in the eye. I'm talking. After the date was done, <laughs> I say goodbye. We gave one another a hug, I believe. And she says to me, you are the most amazing man. I appreciate <laughs> what you are. I didn't say a word. I hardly said a word. She didn't know anything <laughs> about me. I'm telling you. <laughs> that was like, oh my gosh. I she didn't even know I had brothers. She didn't know anything. <laughs> she knew nothing. Nothing. But I was amazing. Well, there you go. What do I learn from my kids? Shut up, dude. <laughs> Be quiet. If you're gonna talk, ask questions and listen because you are calcifying. There. That's what my kids teach. Love that. That's great. That's what, great. What gives you hope these days, Stephen? Hope is a hard, hope is a precious commodity yeah. in but our nowadays, world, right? right? Yeah. Where yeah. do you get it? How do you get it? Well, Mike, I, I, I get it from the Lord. I get it from watching peaceful protesters. I get it from people really listening. I get it from... Ryan and Olivia just almost two Christmases ago gave me a bass guitar. So now uh, <laughs> my arm is sore than heck. I've been playing bass for, for two, <laughs> two months. My wife tells me if my arm gets sore enough, if I could show her the fingering, she'd take over when they put me <laughs> in a walker. She tells me, my wife tells me I'm a rock star. That gives me hope. Even, hey, though, I, even though I know she's kidding, Mike. <laughs> I don't think she thinks that. Anyway, that gives me hope. My kids give me hope. Uh, we had a dog named Bella for 14 and a half years. I got my first dog at the age of 50 because my dad didn't want dogs pooping and peeing on his sacred lawn. So I get the dog. Bella dies. And I'm telling you, I lost my best walking friend for 14 and a half years. But what happens Olivia, Olivia and Ryan, they get a dog. They've been married two years. They get a dog and they name him because Ryan is a very good guitarist. He's in a band called Gringo. The Shores is the name of the album. He's coming out with his second. Oh, see, this is a pitch or something. 
So, so, hey, we'll, anyway, we'll, we'll, so they we'll get a dog on. and they call the dog George Harrison. Oh, wow. Love it. I so love it's it. our first grand doggy. What do I have hope in? Maybe grandbabies. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. That'd well, be exciting. I'll tell you what, Stephen, you know what gives what one of the things that gives what me gives hope, is, hope? Uh, is talking to you and, and knowing that there's people out there that that uh, are striving to make a difference, not only in their own lives, but in the lives of others. I mean, it's a, that's a powerful thing. And if we, if, you know, if we could all, you, you mentioned earlier, and I think Mike said it, man, if, if everybody was thinking more about other people, what a great place this would be. Right. And I think if there was uh, more Stephen Mitchell's in the world, this would be a, a pretty phenomenal place. And more Tyler Golds and more Mike Freeman's, man, with what you guys have done with this podcast, it is a blessing. I've heard about five of them. It's a blessing. Well, Stephen, you're people part of it. Them. You're people people telling part of it. stories. And I, I, I just want to, I want to, I want to say something to you, uh, brother. I wish we were in person, but um, this is hard, right? This living thing is hard. This, if we're trying to do it right, this being a husband, being a dad, you know, being a contributor in our community, it's hard. And I, uh, I give thanks for for our friendship yeah. because. Uh, you're a little further down the path, right? <laughs> yeah, Mike. <laughs> Tyler, I've talked about this before, but there is positive comparison. And when I look, when I look at Stephen's life, he's showing me a path that I want to follow, no, right? Stephen's and I would love to be rich, standing in 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 my world at sixty-seven like you are in yours brother so thank you thank you for thank you for uh for pouring into us tonight man i feel you, i i feel edified and that's what this is about so here it is steven we're we've if you believe it if you can even believe it it's been two hours that we've been together seriously <laughs> you believe that? oh my gosh Isn't it crazy? okay but oh my you, know? you guys are amazing <laughs> oh seriously i had no idea it's been, it's gone fast and it's been fun. And, and uh, what, what I've recognized uh, over the course of two hours is that you've led a rich life and you're, you, you lead a rich life. And, you know, one of the things that we do in this podcast uh, to end every episode is to ask our guests, what does it mean to you to be the richest man in town? So we've, we've offered that question to you, Stephen, what does it mean to you to be the richest man in town? That... I have room to grow. I have room to grow. I I have a path that the Lord blesses, shows me mercies anew, loves me unconditionally. I have a loving family, but I have room to grow. When I, you know, I jokingly told you that after something with my wife, with when I roll my eyes at Julie or whatever, and I have to beat myself with reeds, it's like, too many times i sound like some kind of miracle man but all you got to do is talk to my kids and my wife and then you know what i'm no prophet anymore but what makes me rich is that i know that i have to love and i have room to grow and the lord allows it he just says expand the windshield it's here it's here Put on different glasses. Go over there. Listen. Stop. Enjoy. Take a moment. Breathe. Lift up that kid in the grocery store line. I mean, I. Uh, that's what makes you rich. That's what makes you rich. And in my case, or any believer, it really is the contrast of what it caused peter to just say i have nowhere else to go nobody can say that if they don't open that door they can't say it because it's all in my own heart it's all noise it's all really loud clanging gong clanging cymbal without love that's it man it's chaos oh she whiz 
Oh my gosh, every once in a while I watch the TV, I say immediately, Lord, either beam me up or I'm going to throw something at it. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, Stephen, I, I, uh, I love that, that thought of, you know, room to grow and, and room to improve. And, and uh, I, I just, I've loved the, the time that we've been able to spend tonight. I, I came into this podcast not knowing Stephen very well, spent a few minutes with you on the phone the other night before, uh, before this show. And uh, as always happens at the end of these, these episodes, I, I walk away feeling like I have a new friend and, and I'm grateful for you and I'm grateful for your words. You do, Tyler, and I have one in you, and I have one in you, Mike. I and the great thing about this, the great thing about this, this, this whole, the premise of this show, that word rich, right? In the end, it is not what we get, but what we give, uh-huh. right? And it's that love that we give that makes all the difference. Amen. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> if I could, if it, I have a lot of people asking me what this podcast thing is about. I just point them to this episode, right? Uh, This is the spirit of this, uh, of, of this project is sitting down with guys like Stephen Mitchell. We always close with that last question. We're going to kind of break the form here. Okay. Anything that you absolutely felt like you had to say in our time together that we did not get to, because you, this was a deep pool that we swam in tonight. And I just want to make sure that I, I, I give you that as, as one friend to the other. Okay. Yep. So here's the turning point. Here's, here's the, the clo- turning point. Here's, here's your closing words, all right? Okay, my closing words. All right. Here's the turning point of my faith. So he tells me to read the Bible, right? So what did I find in the Bible? Here's what I found. Remember I told you, like, in religion that I had rather than a personal relationship. That's the difference. There's no way, no how that I would have been any kind of disciple. After I read the word, the strongest thing that came to me was those guys are just like me. They are just like me. Peter becomes the first Pope and he denies the Lord three times. I can go on and on with Thomas. I can go on and on. Those men are just like me. That revelation turned me around. That put me with dirt on the ground, on my sandals, walking with Jesus. That was the turning point. So when I am talking to loved ones and family members about this joy that I have, and I'm talking eternity, The other thing that turned me was this. And this is in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. This book turned me on my ear. I am trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. They're talking about Jesus. C.S. Lewis is talking about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said that sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says that he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make the choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But not, but let us not, come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Either he was or he wasn't. I, I don't even need to speak after that. I feel like... Uh, the mic drop, Stephen. Yeah, I, I, I love that quote. I love that, that part of that 
that book that you just read. I, I love all of that. Um, Stephen, it's been, it's been an absolute pleasure tonight. And, uh, I'm grateful for the, for the time and for the moments. Uh, I'm grateful for the inspiration that I felt to do, to do better and be better through our conversation. And, and I, I knew that was going to happen tonight, Stephen. I knew it. I and say, I, hey, Tyler, I say we hang a part one on this bad boy and get in this guy's calendar and bring him back. There's, uh, some, hey, there's, some, there's some things. Hey, man. There are some things, Stephen. Because, brother, somebody's going to listen to you and they're going to say, he's just like me. Hey, right? Man. And they're going to hear what you did and they're going to say, maybe I could do that. Oh, maybe I got my. this thing, right? Maybe I got this thing that's kicking my tail for decades and I'm done with it, right? Maybe, just maybe, tuning in to Richest Men in Town podcast episode with Stephen Mitchell does something. Well, Stephen, right, it's, been, it's been a blast. Hey, you guys. Have a great night, and we're going to do this again <laughs> another time. Again. Oh, God, you're a blessing, man. Thanks a lot, you guys. I love you very hey, much. And proud really of you. Really proud you. of you. Love you. Love you. honor. See ya. Good idea, Ernie. A toast <laughs> to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>